my name is Asfandiar Mir. I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at, uh, at Stanford's uh, Center for International Security uh, and Cooperation. Uh, I work on uh, issues related to counterterrorism, U.S. foreign policy, and uh, international relations of South Asia. Um, and today's event is jointly organized by the Center for International Security and Cooperation uh, and the Center for South Asia. So thank you uh, to the organizers uh, and, and, and sponsors. Uh, we are absolutely delighted to, to welcome to Stanford uh, Her Excellency, the former Foreign Minister of Pakistan, uh, Hina Rabani Kar. Uh, thank you, Minister, for being here. Uh, Minister Kar was the 26th Foreign Minister of Pakistan. Uh, serving in office from 2011 to 2013. Uh, currently, she's a member of Pakistan's uh, National Assembly, where she represents uh, the, the famous political party, the political party of, uh, 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 of Benazir Bhutto, uh, uh, the Pakistan People's Party. Uh, but Mr. M Minister Khar is a, is a trailblazer in her own right. She was the first woman foreign minister of Pakistan. Uh, and I'd argue she's also left uh, a deep imprint on Pakistan's foreign policy, uh, having advocated for a, a regional pivot which uh, prioritizes integrating South Asia, uh, which remains one of the least integrated regions of the world. Uh, she's also called for and worked on resolution of outstanding disputes between India, Pakistan, uh, and Afghanistan. And for those of you who are not up to speed with the history of South Asia and how uh, how the United States has, has uh, featured in that region. Uh, the minister was also at the helm uh, in a very challenging period of the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. Uh, her stint overlapped uh, with nearly 100,000 U.S. troops uh, stationed in Pakistan's neighboring Afghanistan. She was also around uh, when the United States government raided inside Pakistan uh, to, to capture and ended up you know, killing Osama bin Laden. So, so, so the minister has, has seen uh, the highs and the very many lows of the U.S.-Pakistan yes, yes. relationship. Minister, I'm very excited uh, for this opportunity to speak with you. Uh, and, you know, as, as we were speaking earlier, um, you know, U.S. foreign policy watchers, South, you know, South Asia analysts vigorously debate the U.S.-Pakistan relationship, uh, which, to put mildly, has been strained uh, now for a decade. But at the same time, it is extremely consequential for both the countries. Um, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State uh, Alice Wells recently called uh, U.S.'s relationship with Pakistan amongst the most complex and most consequential one mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, that, that, that exists. Uh, and from my vantage point, working on issues of counterterrorism, uh, U.S. policy in Afghanistan, nuclear security, you know, I strongly agree with, uh, with the Secretary's uh, sentiment. So let me open by asking, uh, uh, by asking you to provide us with an interpretation of the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. Uh, uh, where, where do you think it is at? Uh, and if you have a diagnosis for the recent contemporary past, uh, and whether you expect this, this current trajectory to hold or change going forward. Okay. So I think, uh, first of all, thank you for this and uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, now, uh, within the uh, clearly, look, relations between two countries have to be based not on uh, imaginary friendships and watching out for each other's interests, but literally they're always rooted in watching out uh, every country's own interests, right? So there has to be an alignment of interests for a relationship to uh, remain consequential uh, and remain important. And we also know that in today's world and since ever, Every relationship is always wanted to be considered to be important. And I used to say in the Foreign Office that there are so many strategic dialogues we have with so many countries that nothing remains strategic about them. Because you cannot have a strategic dialogue with 150 countries in the world, right? Because then which is the country that you don't have a strategic dialogue with? And that is the important country, because there seems to be something yeah. interesting there. So uh, so on, on the US-Pakistan side, let's. I'm not going to be diplomatic about it. The alignment of interest within the region does not exist. Uh, and not because of any fault of Pakistan, because of the position that the US has decided to take. I believe today US lacks confidence as a country which is still the only major power, uh, which is not uh, as, it, it feels far more threatened than it has reason to be. And in feeling that much threatened, it has decided to make containment of China to be the primary goal of its national you know, considered to be a primary national security interest. And therefore, how it manages its relations within the region that I come from and outside of it are all determined by who and what is with 
or, you know, China and who isn't in some ways. Uh, and uh, we don't need, you know, uh, just to give you, uh, just to try and give credibility to what I'm saying, uh, in the last few months only, I, I think this process started uh, very visibly, tangibly, since 2010 of this U.S. Uh, sort of real serious concern about China and then realigning their policy within South Asia also. Uh, but uh, look at this statements which are coming in from any important uh, U.S policy leader, um, much as it was very clearly articulated in Munich also, with both Secretary Esper and Secretary Pompeo deciding to spend pretty much all of their allocated time on China and the threat that is emanating from there. So that is what is guiding U.S. policy in uh, you know, South Asia. And of course, we know that the strategic ties that they tried to instill uh, since 2010 with India. Um, and there are many pillars of that. The nuclear, uh, you know, deal was one of them. And uh, beyond that also, I think there are many exceptional things that they've tried to do for India and for each other. Uh, so, so really, since containment of China is the primary or the most overwhelming policy goal, and on the sidelines somewhere you have trying to get out of Afghanistan, in which Pakistan does come in, but not, I believe, uh, in, a, in a way which is, which is long term, uh, strategic. Okay, it might have short-term significance, but uh, in the long term, so that puts Pakistan in a very difficult position because Pakistan is not is not a country, and neither should or, and no country should uh, be placed in a position where you ask to choose between two countries who you both want to be friends with, right? Who, who you want to be friends with, both of them, because you have interest with both. Uh, Pakistan doesn't want to be on the wrong side of the U.S. Why should it? Uh, I think we have convergence of interest which goes far beyond, uh, frankly speaking, many other countries within the region. Because what happens in Afghanistan, if there's no peace and stability in Afghanistan, we are the first ones to suffer, as we have been the first to suffer in the past also. Because much as Pakistan has been given the offload of all the blame uh, on Afghanistan, uh, do not forget that Pakistan lost more personnel to this war uh, than the U.S. even. And, uh, you know, uh, the effect on our civilians obviously is far, far, far greater. So, uh, so yes, this is an interesting uh, sort of uh, environment that we find ourselves in. There's, there have been tectonic shifts mm -hmm. in the last, I would say, decade only, okay? Because you do remember, and I'm, I don't know how many people uh, sort of follow Pakistan and that region enough to know that, because we were very aligned uh, during the Cold War time, right? And we were very aligned when our soil and our minds were both used to infiltrate what was the Mujahideen at that time and the soldiers of God and celebrated Mujahideen at that time to uh, defeat the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. Now, the mistake that Pakistan made was that we were the only country which allowed our soil and mines to be used. Everybody else used the cash mm. and the policy. We used, we allowed, the mistake that we made was allowed our soils and our mines to be infiltrated with extremist thoughts. And it took us a while to be able to get out of it. So I think Pakistan is at a happy place, is a decent place strategically. Uh, I, I, I'm not very, um, you know, I would say I would be, I, I would not be very concerned personally mm. about Pakistan not uh, being uh, a great strategic ally of the U.S. because it hasn't done us much good in the past. Uh, I think being a strategic ally of a country which has huge interest and which whose interest you have to tow every time they take a decision is not something that, so good luck to India playing that role now. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> on, you know, on... I think this is a good segue to a second issue that is, uh, you know, that's been on my mind this past week, and I'm sure it's on the mind uh, of, of some of the people in this in the room, um, which is Afghanistan. You know, you, you 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 briefly mentioned Afghanistan. The U.S. government has now struck a peace deal mm -hmm. uh, with the insurgent Afghan Taliban to end its longest uh, longest war. Uh, you know, a remarkable event, mm -hmm. monumental event. It has uh, strong echoes. Um, uh, of the end of the uh, of the U.S. engagement in Vietnam, uh, you know, through the the the, 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 the Paris Accords, um, um, and it appears that Pakistan has played a role. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I interact with uh, with uh, some U.S. policymakers uh, working on um, South Asia, uh, and they tell me that the Pakistani military leadership, and specifically mm -hmm. the current chief of the Pakistani army. Uh, has leaned on the Afghan Taliban to strike a deal with mm -hmm. the U.S. Um, and uh, back in 2018, uh, people were skeptical. A lot of people, even the, the U.S. Special Envoy 
support of Afghanistan, Zalmi Khalilzad was skeptical uh, whether Pakistan will play such a role or not. Um, uh, so, so all of us are very surprised mm -hmm. uh, with how Pakistan has has played its hand in this mm -hmm. in this particular moment of U.S. engagement in mm -hmm. Afghanistan, uh, given that uh, it has uh, it has played what many perceive here to be an adversarial role. So, I'm wondering, mm -hmm. uh, you're on the opposition benches, so perhaps mm -hmm. you can uh, you can speak to this uh, more openly. Mm -hmm. Are you surprised? Um, and and you know, <laughs> even if not, can you help us understand? Mm -hmm the Pakistani calculus uh, on helping the U.S. Mm -hmm. in the current moment? Mm -hmm. I think the calculus of any country should be helping itself. And uh, if that helps others, uh, good. If that doesn't help others, uh, too bad. Uh, so, and if you look at, because you see, I think Pakistan has gotten so much blame uh, for what went wrong in Afghanistan, and uh, much of it went wrong because it was terrible. Uh, and you know the latest Afghan papers, Afghanistan papers, I think many, many, now we have enough evidence, I think, to prove how many mistakes were made in Afghanistan. So um, I, I'm not surprised at this at all of Pakistan playing a positive role, because in some ways, I think, I, I hate to say it, uh, but it seems like what Pakistan was saying all along turned out to be right, right? Because uh, Pakistan was considered to be supporting elements uh, which were outside of Afghanistan. I, I don't think that was it, it was support as much as having to live with the reality that was enforced on you, right? Because you can't uh, take on everyone at the same time. Pakistan had enough of its own problems to take care of. You know that we had three large-scale military operations within the geographical boundaries of Pakistan because the entities such as TTP were taking over land mass within the country. So we had battles to fight and to win, which we... Uh, you know, with the grace of God, have. But uh, so, so when I say that Pakistan seemed to always be right, look, there is a landscape, uh, and there are there there's certain entities which are imposed, and there's certain entities which are natural part of the landscape. So you cannot go to a certain country and say that we believe that your country's this 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 ethnicity should not is not good for the country, and therefore they should let's just act they don't exist, right? And let's let them be the adversary and we will fight them out. And then you try and fight them out and then you are, you know, unable to, let's say, win them over on the ground or otherwise. And then you realize that uh, $2 trillion have been, you know, spent, many lives have been lost, and you are, frankly speaking, in a situation where you went into a region trying to take it out of, uh, you know, bring peace and stability there. And from, as a neighboring country, we saw none of that peace and stability, because many people don't know this. Pre-9-11, in Pakistan, there was one single suicide bomb inside Pakistani territory, right? After the peace and stability was supposed to come, post-9, you know, post-Afghan uh, adventure, we had, until the last count, like more than 313. I mean, this is dated information. This is an office, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, we had to do some serious work to be able to get, uh, meaning much of Pakistan's territory back, and uh, we were obviously very involved in that effort. Now, during all of this time, there was what was happening in Afghanistan, which Pakistan was always asked to play a role, not wanting to really reach a negotiated settlement, because we saw what happened a year back, right. when almost the entire settlement was reached, and then one fine day, the president tweets and pulls out of it, right? And what happened before that, many of the elements were not within the American establishment, were not ready. Actually, even today, many of the elements are perhaps not entirely ready. And then you go to the Afghan government side, where many people and groups have an interest not to make this reconciliation work, right? Because the, their share is only going to contract. There's no way their share is, at best, going to remain the same or contract. Now, nobody wants to give away space. It's human nature. So from all of that, I'm not at all surprised that Pakistan would play a role which is helpful. Uh, for the cause, because, uh, you know, you have to try and get a political solution in Afghanistan and allow the Afghans to manage it themselves. The more influence you try and orchestrate there, the more uh, anyone, whether it's the U.S. or Pakistan or India or anyone, the more you will be, end up being a spoiler. Sure. Yeah? So I think it's really time for everyone to do what they need to do, which I believe has been done to a certain extent, and then back off a little bit to allow the, you know, not show support for one or the other, and that goes for the Americans too, because they need to allow the intra-Afghan dialogue to really take place now. Sure. 
So, so let me follow up uh, with this because it's a, it's a question on the minds uh, of uh, you know policymakers uh, across the aisle. Uh, uh, you know, people are wondering. Sure, Pakistan has helped us until now, but but will Pakistan change change tact? Will will it uh, reverse course strategy going forward? And specifically, what are, are there any red lines? Uh, you know, uh, for Pakistan, uh, which if crossed, uh, would lead to uh, to a reconsidering uh, the, the 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 nominal support. Say, uh, people argue Pakistan has provided uh, to the ongoing peace process. Look, I think this is where Pakistan's role ends. Okay, and I think now to because I see this narrative running that, oh, you know, we will see how you will do after this. You know, our role. It's, it's for the Afghans. So I think a lot of responsibility, which is really supposed to be on the shoulders of the Afghan government, or whatever nomenclature you want to use for the people who are in power there, uh, you know, they have to act like they are responsible. So I, I, I find it very interesting when we have the Afghan president saying, oh, Pakistan will continue to do this or continue to. And you know, do not forget that Pakistan also happens to be a country which for the last 10 years has been trying to literally beg the international community to try and allow it to fence its international border with Afghanistan. And then if we are the source of all the terrorism and all the terrorism in Afghanistan is emanating from Pakistan and the support that Pakistan gives to the sanctuaries, etc., etc., then why is the Afghan government itself not very willing to streamline that border and to make sure that there is proper fencing and there is proper technology which is used and therefore people from Pakistan who are creating all the trouble in Afghanistan cannot go. Now we are very interested that we don't have trouble from Awans, and that's why we were, and without any blessings, perhaps, we have gone ahead and started the process and perhaps we'll be ending it very soon, right? Because it is exceptionally important sure. for countries to act like sovereign states. So you can't say that, you know, we're a sovereign state, but all our responsibility of whether what happens in Afghanistan is with Pakistan. I think it's, and, and we've allowed, by the way, the Americans have allowed uh, the Afghan government to get away with that for far too long and being part of that narrative. And their narr the American narrative has changed. Afghan narrative still doesn't change. I, when I say this, I also, I'm, and, and I think my time in the foreign office proves that, an exceptionally strong believer that Pakistan needs to engage with Afghanistan bilaterally, giving them the utmost respect, right? But then the Afghans also have to treat themselves with respect, in the sense that they have to take responsibility for what is within their sovereign borders and ensure that, you know, the red line that you asked, it's very simple. You know, if Afghanistan is going to be used as a staging ground for activity in Pakistan, and, you know, we have enough evidence of that, right? That cannot be, and if Afghanistan uh, entities in Afghanistan are collude with countries who want to harm Pakistan from the other side and try and harm Pakistan, of course it's not going to be. But uh, you eventually, look, I think this whole reconciliation thing teaches us a very big lesson. Eventually, we can all be in adversarial roles um, for as long as we like. We all harm each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, eventually I think we need to try and understand each other's perspective better and to be able to solve these problems, you know, on the table rather than outside of it. I think again, a uh, great segue into my, uh, my next question. Uh, the, the, the country that you left anonymous, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is, a, is of course, a, 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 you know, literally a giant presence mm -hmm. in the region, uh, India. Um, and uh, you know, Pakistan and India not getting along is is old news. It's 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 a, it's a, it's a, it's a seven, seventy year uh, old news. Uh, but uh, you know, but, but despite uh, it being old news, uh, it appears that the relationship has really worsened. Mm -hmm. uh, the two countries have managed to exacerbate mm -hmm. uh, tensions quite a bit. There was a military exchange following uh, a terror attack in the mm -hmm. region of Kashmir last February. Uh, which uh, became very scary. It appeared that the two countries might be inching towards uh, a nuclear con conflagration. Then in August, uh, the Indian Prime Minister uh, 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 mm -hmm. Narendra Modi pulled the autonomy of the region of Kashmir, uh, which um, has had an impact, has, uh, has uh, you know, led to a reaction from Pakistan, a mm -hmm. pretty fierce mm -hmm. reaction. And Indian domestic politics, which many in Pakistan mm -hmm. watch uh, rather carefully, has taken a... Uh, taken a very dark turn. Uh, most recently, evidence in the communal riots mm -hmm. in Delhi, which has uh, which led to 50 deaths. Uh, Pakistan, of course, has a long-standing claim on Kashmir, um, and India now appears uh, more aggressive than before in getting Pakistan to back off on that. Mm -hmm. uh, it appears more willing to use military force. Many people are worried about uh, about the prospect of uh, of you know, of a military exchange, which changes political facts on the ground. 
so let me ask you, um, how do you read Pakistan's policy and strategy going forward? Uh, is it going to play defense or offense? And of course, one key question that arises, given the history of the last 30 years, um, is that whether Pakistan will step up aid to the insurgency that's going on in Kashmir. Okay, let me just answer the last question first. Yeah. Absolute no. Uh, I think we've learned our lessons from history, and there's complete clarity, and there is evidence from the ground, and I don't know, do we bend backwards? How do we... Uh, so, so it's interesting because, and, and from there, let me just jump into the fact that what is happening over here is that Pakistan is a country which has had a troubled history, but is now correcting all of that, right? India is a country which has had a very good history, but is going towards a very troubling current and future scenario. It's literally like that. So we're here, so we're here and we're trying to go up and India was here and is sliding down at the speed of light, perhaps. Right? And uh, you, you said that the relationship has worsened. I don't think the relationship has worsened. I think India has worsened. Uh, so I think I take no blame, and I'm somebody who's very fond of blaming my own country when we make the mistakes to pointing them out, because I think you cannot improve if you don't know what mistakes you've made, right? But uh, we have, we share no blame of this worsening of relations, because this has been the unilateral actions taken by a country which has actually gone rogue against its own citizens. Because when you talk about Kashmir, look, I do not believe that Indian occupied Kashmir and the people who live in there are Indian citizens. But Narendra Modi believes they're Indian citizens, right? Every Indian leader who's come to believe that they are Indian citizens. Now, when the country goes rogue on its own citizens, because there are uh, constitutional commitments given to them from Nehru all the way down to Manmohan Singh in various forms. There is Supreme Court orders. There is Indian uh, occupied Kashmir high court orders, etc., which go to explain how the state has to give these special rights to the Kashmiri population. Now you renegade on all of that and take that away. That's you going rogue on their citizens, right? Then you have bilateral commitments with Pakistan, which you basically ask Pakistan that despite the fact that India went to the United Nations Security Council, it wasn't Pakistan which went there in the first place, that we don't want to really go work on the Security Council resolutions, let's do a bilateral. So that was the similar agreement, you go rogue on that. Then you have UNSC resolutions, which clearly articulate what the two countries are ought to do in order to resolve what is considered to be an internationally recognized dispute. So you go rogue on that also. So then what sort of a message are we sending to the whole world, to our own citizens and to uh, anyone else who's there to see? So the, 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 the dissent of India right now is uh, so very problematic. And what is even more problematic perhaps is the silence of America as India descends into this chaos. Uh, evident, uh, right? So interestingly, in December, we hear the State Department talking about religious freedom concerns in, about Pakistan. This is when the streets of Delhi were burning, when Kashmir was in a complete lockdown, when Muslims were being thrown inside not only prisons, but being, uh, you know, literally killed on the streets of the capital of India. And the U.S. is concerned about religious freedom in Pakistan. That's a problem. But that is a problem. Of course it is a problem. But, but you see, uh, Sunil, even before you ask the question, let me, let me say this. The, the, why am I not concerned about it today? I'm not concerned about it today because the state does not promote, uh, you know, hostility towards minority. The state is trying to protect the minorities, but people, yes, there will be some strains of people. But the state is not an arbitrator and promoter and supporter of those people. The state is trying to come in the way of those people and trying to protect the minorities, right? So exactly what I'm saying, here the state itself is allowing its policemen. We've seen these videos. They are exceptional. They're not only disturbing. They are, they are blood curdling. Okay, and 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 I, I'm concerned with India, not because of just Pakistan. Okay, and, and not just look at the dynamics that it sort of unleashes on the entire region. Because here is a region which needs to coalesce together to solve the problem of poverty, which happens to be host to one of the largest population of the poor. Is a region which has largely not been able to. Uh, deliver to its people, whether it's on education or health or clean drinking water or sanitation or any of the things that are considered to be an absolute norm and necessity and, you know, in the first world and the second world. And uh, here we are, a, a region which is now being thrown into the midst of, frankly speaking, a nuclear conflagration and any type of, you know, I have never been concerned about military um, sort of, you know, uh, our conventional military power. I think it was too much. Uh, I'm today concerned about how it matches up with India because today, for the first time, in February, we saw India, since 1971, for the first time, 
penetrate into our airspace, come into our airspace and try to do military adventurism. And we all found out, the international media found out, we all found out, well, nothing existed over there. So what, does, what happens to the credibility of this country that the US wants to be the net security provider to all of South Asia and all of, uh, frankly speaking, beyond that? Right. It, it, it's a very, uh, for me, it's a very worrying trend. The worrying trend, what is happening in India, very worrying trend. Even perhaps a bigger, you know, more worrying uh, is how the U.S. is so interested in the containment of China that it's, it's being mystified. You know, everything else doesn't matter and it su suddenly has stopped being a promoter of the values that have given the, the U U.S. what I consider to be its primary, primary source of its superpower status. So, so, so let me follow up. Given, given you mentioned the the U.S. in this this context, what role do you see, uh, or what's a healthy role that the United States can play uh, in, uh, you know, in, in bringing peace to South Asia? Uh, you know, we've we've often heard the line uh, uh, from senior Pakistani policymakers that the, the U.S. should med mediate uh, on Kashmir. Uh, is that the role uh, you also see for for the U.S. or or do you? You know, do you, do you think, think differently about the issue? I think we spent far too many decades uh, hoping for U.S. mediation in Kashmir for me to be optimistic about that scenario anymore, right? And I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's not worked. Uh, it's not really been tried very effectively and certainly, and uh, clearly the position from India's side always was very consistently that they want to do it bilaterally. So you see, understand what's happening over here. A multilateral dispute, you know, what is considered to be a multilateral dispute because internationally recognized, so everybody knew in Security Council in it, so therefore, uh, in internationally recognized dispute. India says for the last three decades or so, let's, this is a bilateral issue, please don't interfere. It says to the whole world, every time somebody wants to interfere, it's a bilateral issue. Now, India is saying, it's a unilateral issue. It's our issue to resolve. We are the, you know, net security provider as given the badge of honor by the Americans, and we will do as we please. And the world, please mind your own business, right? As we kill our own people, what we consider to be our own people, etc. So this becomes an exceptionally problematic situation. So when you ask what should the US do, let me tell you what I think the US is doing and what it should not do. And then we'll come to perhaps what sure. it should do, right? What the US is doing is uh, that it is creating not only the pathway, but encouraging uh, India to act in the manner that it is currently acting, okay? Because the US is currently so obsessed with its China containment, and the fear of being overtaken economically and in, uh, technologically perhaps by China, which I think is bad strategy because the fear is more than the reality. And in reacting to that fear, the US appears very small and weak and inconfident. And perhaps the fear will become a reality much sooner than it would have otherwise. So, so what the US is doing is uh, you know, allowing India to go on this journey unchecked and fully supported and promoted by them, right? And now, a point in case is the February 2019 statement that came right after India did what it did in, you know, came coming into Pakistani airspace, uh, putting some load on and uh, moving away and claiming that it had killed a terrorist camp. And the, Ind and the American statement came, giving them full sanction and saying, yes, preemptive strike, uh, Pakistan should manage its terrorism problem. So again, being, being, take, you know, being led by what used to be the past, and superimposing onto on the present. And lo and behold, we find out there, were no, there was no terrorist outfit over there. There was no terrorist network over there. There were no people over there. And then you have satellite imagery, which came from not Pakistani sources, but international sources, which proved that. So where is the credibility of the United States of America right now? How am I supposed to look at them as an international arbitrator right. or wanting them to intercede in a issue where I, frankly speaking, there's not, not a fair arbitrator at all? It's very interesting you say that because I think that it's a it's a it's, it's a departure from where uh, uh, where current Pakistani policy is at aggressively you know is working towards and trying to seek a U.S. intercession. But uh, I would seek it if it I thought it would be useful. Sure. I, I don't see them uh, making a useful intercession here. Interesting. Let me let me turn towards a, a, a you know a topic issue area. You've you've you 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 know you've mentioned a, a few times now. U.S. containment of, of China. Um, and I mean, I'll, I'll acknowledge that all of a sudden, uh, you know, after fighting terrorism for 17 to 18 years, we have uh, discovered or rediscovered great power competition. Uh, we have woken up uh, 
to the rise of China and to uh, to an emboldened uh, Vladimir Putin in, in 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 Russia. We've taken a closer look at um, at the grand strategies they are pursuing. These two countries are pursuing outside of their regions, um, and and given that all of that. Um, uh, you know, challenges the status quo, the the rules based international order, as many people mm. like to believe. Uh, it is deeply concerning mm. to U.S. Uh, policymakers, and of course, Pakistan prominently features in this in this great power equation, not just through the lens of India, uh, but due to its uh, historic uh, close relationship with China. Uh, and in recent years, China has been massively investing in Pakistan. It's building a port. Uh, investing in road networks, energy infrastructure. It's really trying to integrate the two countries uh, uh, you know, uh, as part of the Belt and Road Initiative. And there's a specific Pakistan component for it. It's called the, the China-Pakistan mm -hmm. Economic Corridor. Um, but here's what's puzzling about it. I think three years ago, it seemed like Pakistan had more or less bid farewell to the U.S. Mm -hmm. alliance. You spoke mm -hmm. about the traditional uh, pro-U.S. Mm -hmm. positionality that Pakistan maintained, say, during the Cold War. Um, and it appeared that Pakistan was squarely moving in the Chinese uh, orbit. Mm. Um, but but uh, you know, many close observers of, of South Asia are now detecting signals, some indicators of grumblings mm -hmm. uh, from Pakistan on its uh, uh, on its current relationship with China. Uh, we, you know, there's been uh, some some public reporting that some of the, the, these projects have slowed down. They haven't been transparent enough, and their concerns. Uh, uh, among senior Pakistani policymakers. Uh, so, so my question to, to you is, how do you see the situation? Where is Pakistan at uh, on China right now? Uh, and should this great power competition intensify? There's more push and pull from both US mm -hmm. and, uh, and China. What direction will Pakistan go in? Sure. OK, uh, exceptionally interesting question and a good question. And uh, um, OK, so I will answer the micro question that you asked before, because, uh, you know, the grumbling on the relationship with China and some concerns about how this money has not been spent transparently. I, I think that's, uh, I would discount that uh, very heavily, because I don't think, strategically speaking, there's any grumbling whatsoever. When it comes to the specific projects, uh, if they're all in the public spending realm, uh, and it is our job as government of Pakistan to ensure that they're transparent. So if, if we haven't done our job properly, I don't think we have reason to grumble on China. Okay, the Chinese have never kept us from making any of this transparent. And uh, uh, having done business with Chinese uh, for a pretty long time, um, I, I think they're great uh, bilateral partners when it comes to any sort of, um, you know, assistance on large scale infrastructure projects. I think they bypass every other entity in terms of being they're uh, offering loans which are at concessional terms and uh, bypass what the World Bank offers and anyone else. So obviously in a country which is starved for infrastructural uh, development, if an offer is on the table for us to be able to find financing at concessionary terms to be able to build our infrastructure, which is going to uh, kickstart you know, uh, or assist us in our growth towards development, why wouldn't we? It is in our national interest to do so. Why wouldn't we and why would anyone ask any questions of us or, you know, uh, put us in the dock for that? So that is a settled matter. And I think Pakistan will continue to be on that journey uh, to do what is best for itself. And no uh, country, every country has a right to do that. Now, the great power competition is very interesting. But before that, you talked about the rules-based international order and con concerns about the... Oh, Yes. My, my point was, I, I, I completely got your point. I, so, but, some people say that such an order yes, uh, exists. Okay, good. Or existed. Good. Uh, good. It I'm, doesn't I'm, exist I'm, I'm glad people like that exist in the world. <laughs> okay. Many people like that. So, yeah. So, and our concerns about the revisionist Russia and the emerging China coming in the way of a rules based international order. I think the rules based international order currently is getting the hammers and the strikes from the people who were the ones who benefited most from it and from the people who were the preservers, protectors, makers of the rules-based international order, okay? When you look at international climate change agreements, you know which countries are not wanting to participate in that. When you look at the WTO, you know which countries are not sending the judges to ensure that the WTO remains functional. This is all rules-based international order. These are all the institutions which base, which make the international order, right? Because the international order is, frankly speaking, making a figment of our imagination. 
all these institutions in the form of the United Nations, Security Council, other institutions, the WTO, all these are what make, whether we comply or not comply, whether we encourage people to become part of the international climate change fight or discourage people and say it doesn't even exist. That is what international leadership is about, right? We're seeing a dearth of it coming in from where we're sitting right now. Uh, so from uh, seeing the United States and having experienced the United States, which everybody looked up to for its soft image more than anything else, for its soft power more than anything else, um, from knowing that how uh, much the American diplomats would fight uh, with, you know, and encourage fight in a positive way and encourage us to be, to understand the climate, you know, climate change and contribute towards that and be part of international collaborative efforts. Now you see a trend which is very different. So I don't think this, this threat, perception of threat to the international based, rules based order is, um, you know, could be a bit fictitious. Okay. Uh, so uh, that settled now on the great power competition. The great power competition is obviously in your face right now, right? And uh, I generally believe it is primary the reason, it is primarily the reason which is creating all the unnecessary, unhealthy reverberations that are we feeling in the world today, right? Because when you start looking at everyone as an adversary, you're not able to sit with people and solve the problem, but you want to fight them out and want to... I get surprised, and I, I genuinely say this, I, I genuinely believe it when I say this, that I get surprised when you have really important people from the United States spending all of their time on trying to scare people of China, right? That's not a leadership role, I believe. That's a role of saying, oh, we are feeling very threatened. Somebody's taking a position. Please let us save ourselves. By, and we will ask you not to engage. We will ask you. How they dealt with AIIB, by the way, was in some ways a, a trailer, as they call it, right? Because on AIIB bank, if you remember, uh, everybody was given these, uh, you know, diplomatic notes to not become part of it. The, the uh, British, the... Germans, the Europeans, you know, many Asian countries who they thought they had influence over. And frankly speaking, nobody ended up listening. Mm. Okay, because people said, well, it's very similar to what you did with the ADB and with the World Bank and with the IMF. And yes, it's going to be a Chinese who's going to head it. But isn't the World Bank always headed by an American? Isn't the IMF always headed by a European? So if the Chinese are trying to create this fund for infrastructure development. What's so wrong with that? Mm. You know, doesn't it? So you're saying that infrastructure development in Asia is not a good idea? You know, what is... Because your, your, your um, rhetoric doesn't meet the reality on the ground. It's exceptionally important for a state to remain credible. If your rhetoric is not going to meet the reality on the ground that I see, I'm going to be very wary of you, right? So I think it's similar. Now, for Pakistan, the place to choose is very simple. You know, we don't have a choice to make. Why should we choose? We are good friends with Americans. We intend to remain good friends with Americans. But we are... And by the way, the world has woken up to China now. We were always very strong, you know, strategic allies with China since, since we were born in 1947 and forward and just through the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. In fact, that's been a consistent, uh, perhaps the cornerstone and a very, very consistent part of Pakistan's foreign policy and Pakistan itself. I mean, China, a military rule, a democratic rule, a People's Party government, a PMLN government, consistent mm -hmm. on China because also because China has also been consistent with Pakistan. So it's our national interest to preserve that very important relationship. Great, great. So, so we've, we've covered a lot of ground here, and I want to give the audience a chance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have one more question, and you know, if there's time towards the end, come back to it. Uh, so, so please raise your hands if, you, if you'd like to ask a question, and uh, I'd encourage you to ask your best question, but you know, if it's very pressing, you can, you can attach and put and, and, and cast yeah. One more on China. Mm -hmm. uh, when uh, I was in Lahore now, uh, I talked with many people about uh, the relationship to the U.S. And, uh, uh, and the relationship with China. And you just said that uh, as far as you are concerned, we will be good friends with the United States and we mm -hmm. will good, we could continue to be good friends mm -hmm. with China. Mm -hmm. That was presented to me somewhat differently mm -hmm. because there are lots of people much more critical mm -hmm. of the U.S. than you mm -hmm. have been this mm -hmm. morning. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and 
Uh, they see the I'm a former diplomat. <laughs> <laughs> they see the, uh, they mm -hmm. see China as an alternative mm -hmm. to the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, would, uh, that's one question. Mm -hmm. and I have another mm -hmm. question about mm -hmm. India. But, uh, mm -hmm. uh, okay, I think uh, absolutely not. I don't see. I, I think the U.S. has a very specific role. You see, the U.S. wants to be the net arbiter, continue to play a role wants to perhaps not play the role it played in the Middle East, but certainly in the South China Sea and in this broader region, it wants to continue, it wants to play a bigger role, right? Now, when that happens, we are, our interests are not, uh, our interests, I believe, in interests, as we perceive them, are perfectly aligned with that of the US. Yeah. Okay, because if they, their stated policy is they want to bring peace and stability in Afghanistan and in the region. I cannot say our policy or our intent is not to do that. So I see in alignment of interest. Now, how you play that policy out, if that crosses the red lines that each has for the other, it creates a conflict, right? However, with China, as I'm saying, there is absolutely no doubt on the consistency of policy and in the efficacy of this relationship as it has been proven over decades, right? We don't call out names, we don't blame each other, we conduct our policy with behind closed doors, foreign policy, you know, with China. The Americans do it very differently if they're have a problem in Afghanistan, it's quite, you know, it was quite evident that Pakistan was considered to be the whipping boy for that, right? And uh, we don't get treated like that by others. Uh, so despite that, we say that the Americans are the Americans and we have to learn to live with them and hopefully happily live with them. I don't see a, uh, see, uh, as I said, I see, I, I genuinely see their interest, at least their stated objectives in the region are not different than ours. So we shouldn't have to choose. Now, the, you were by your wonderfully forthright. Uh, it was a joy to read some greetings this morning. Uh, India, uh, you are, of course, world famous for having opened up a uh, relationship with mm -hmm. India or attempted mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, when I was in Lahore now, I was taken to that famous border crossing mm -hmm. in India yeah. at the flag lowering. <laughs> the Vaga border. Yeah. And I'm wondering. Is there a difference, and mind you, the, the members of the elite I talked to uh -huh. in Pakistan, they were all extremely thoughtful mm. about India, mm. very rational mm. and so on. Mm. Is there a gap between the elites in Pakistan mm. and the population mm. uh, on, on the issue of India? Mm. Uh, I would uh, absolutely give you evidence to say a vehement no on, on that, okay? And, and, and the very simple evidence I would present to you is the electoral politics. In electoral politics, even during this time, India is a non-issue. I, I non-issue, I mean, when I go to, if I go to campaign, I don't even need to take India's name. I, I will not, because it's all localized issues. It's about education, it's about health, it's about political power, it's completely. In India, Modi just won on Pakistan, okay, by creating this rhetoric, which was hostile. So you see what the narrative that you shape, that you feed into your people, becomes a very potent force. Yeah. Now, the narrative which is being fed on a daily, minute-by-minute -minute basis in India is one which is anti-Muslim, anti-Pakistan, okay? So, by the way, very interesting, just, I, I believe this morning in, 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 in the New York Times, or yesterday in the New York Times, uh, Shiv Shankar Maimon, who I have great respect for, the previous NSA leader, the, the NSA foreign National Secretary, Security National Security Advisor Security and, Security. and Foreign Secretary uh, during uh, Manmohan Singh's time, has actually talked about exactly the same thing. He said that as they do worse economically, because remember that there was a rising, shining India that Modi has now created. And I present to you the three different uh, were, you know, cover stories of The Economist, where the first was, in the last three, the first was uh, China, uh, India beats China, overtaking China on growth. The second was uh, Modi, is he taking India in the right direction or is he taking India back? And the third is, uh, a, what, what, what is in, intolerant India, okay? So it's almost like that, the, those three covers tell you India's journey, squarely, clearly, right? So it, this has been India's journey, and uh, we can only just wish that this goes away, because I don't think this is, this is what Pakistan wants at all. You know, we used to quote India as a good example to our people, as to the democracy, the secularism, all of that. Now all of that has gone away, and we are very, very concerned about the impact of that on the entire region. So, uh, but electoral politics, no, and I don't think we've, because we've, we've stopped feeding this into our people. So it's not, they continue to do so, right? And as Menon, uh, Mr. Menon also um, talks about uh, this, as they do worse economically, as Modi is unable to deliver on all his 
election promises, be it on economic, be it on other issues. Pakistan beating, Muslim beating, and this new re-emerging uh, extremist Hindutva version of itself uh, is going to become the dominant force and on the force which divides and wins and votes. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much for um, your answers to the question. I have, I want to pick up on something you said about India and about uh, what happened last year with the incursion into Pakistani mm -hmm. airspace. Uh, you mentioned the term the danger, at least the danger of nuclear confrontation. Mm -hmm. And you also, I think, were con more concerned also about the state of the overall military relationship with India. So could you say more about that? Um, do you see this as uh, reflecting the overall policy of the Modi government? Uh, is that what, what is driving it? Um, uh, and do you think the danger of uh, a nuclear conflict is growing? Uh, an overwhelming yes, and absolute yes. And, uh, and, and, and bear in mind, uh, when I say this, I say this with a very heavy heart because I'm someone who genuinely did not believe we needed to be ready for the scenario that presents itself today to Pakistan, right? I'm someone who believed that Pakistan over, over, always over-exaggerated the threat perception from India. And it seems I was in the wrong, right? Because now what we see, I'm genuinely concerned about uh, the conventional hardware, uh, you know, especially on the Air Force side, um, balance between India and Pakistan. Because I know now it's not a figment of anyone's imagination, but we have a leader over there who has uh, already delved into this military adventurism. And you see, when he, when, when, when he did that, when he decided to cross Pakistani airspace for the first time since 1971, we could have done anything, right? Because once it was out of India, then it was Pakistan's decision to... Now, what we did was exceptionally mature. We got eventually to a pilot, to planes, and we, instead of saying, look, we have your... You, we, we decided we wanted to bring temperatures down immediately, and we wanted to not move towards a place where ne neither would perhaps have the ability to control the escalatory ladder that we climb on, and, uh, uh, and, and, and we, we dialed it back, right? But uh, then uh, this is a serious concern now, because, you see... If someone, I, I believe when Prime Minister Modi came in, and I was one of the people who genuinely believed that he will perhaps be more Vajpayee-ish, that, you know, you are a strong leader, you have space, you have place in the parliament, you are a strong leader within your party, and now you can deliver and be a statesman. Okay, you had the Gujarat killing past and all of that, but now that you are in the seat, you will be the statesman. He chose to be the other way around, okay? He chose to continue to appease and build on the extremist. He wanted to create more extremist space and continue to build on it. So I'm deeply, deeply concerned about a serious conflict emerging. I'm, 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 I've never been so concerned about the real possibility of such a threat in my 42 years. Uh, I was born post-1971, never experienced a full-scale war. But in February, I slept thinking we might wake up to anything in the morning. It, this is real now. And I'm, concern, I'm, I'm a bit surprised that the world is not waking up to the danger that is being presented by not India, but by Modi, right? So India, good India, okay, but what Modi has done in India, you will not be able to dial it back. This, 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 this seeds of extremist, men, you know, mind, uh, mental maps that you sow in people's heads, you are not able to dial it back. Ask us, we know how long it took, almost three decades since, you know, the Afghan adventure, the previous one. And you, to take extremism out of the mind, it's, it's, it's a long-term uh, uh, journey, and it takes a while for the country to find its place back. And India's far too large, far too big, and far too Hindu, in the sense that right now it's, it literally me, it seems like, you know, if you're Hindu, you're first great citizen. So I, I wanted to say when you asked about that, because you, and, and you have legitimate concerns about religious freedom, minority rights in Pakistan, but what I wanted to po point out is here's a state, as in Pakistan, which is legislating to protect minority rights and religious freedom, right? We've actually actively legislated in the last few years, and the last decade is major legislation, right? Women's rights, minority rights, religious freedom. And India is dialing back on the legislation in the sense that it is actually legislating to make sure that there are the first-class citizens and the second-class citizens. And make no mistake, the Muslims 
are not even considered to be second class but a, a citizenry which doesn't even have the, the 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 you know the ability to feel that the state must come to its protection as we've seen in, displayed in the streets of new delhi i want to bring in uh, you know some of our uh, other participants so a hand sure go ahead sure I, I... I thought your minister, I thought your discussion of uh, Afghan sovereignty and turning back that question was really quite illuminating. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder if you might elaborate on what American, projected American withdrawal from Afghanistan might look like in terms of policy changes that you would anticipate for Pakistan to uh, turn to uh, in Afghanistan as you rationally pursue the UN and the threat. No, sorry, I didn't quite get the question. Could you, could you say that again? Yes. Yeah, so, could you? Um, and I'm trying to say this at least confrontation. No, no, you can say it more confrontation. So I get what you're trying yeah, to say. You've both spoken to the need for Pakistan to advance its own interests mm -hmm. and to respecting Afghan mm -hmm. policy. Mm -hmm. How do you resolve that tension? Okay. And what changes do you expect Pakistan to pursue in its policies if America decides to withdraw? Okay. It, it, you know, if I can add to that, if you, you spoke about, um, you know, Afghan domestic politics, uh, one of Pakistan's main problems since 9-11 or mm -hmm. since the, mm -hmm. you know, the bond conference mm -hmm. has been mm -hmm. that Afghan political elites uh, have this, uh, have this India slant. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they, uh, they like India mm -hmm. uh, and they like India more than Pakistan sure. very, very clearly. And, and that appears to be a problem. So, so looking ahead, mm -hmm. uh, if, uh, you know, if those sorts of leanings of Afghan political elites persist, mm. uh, what, what will Pakistan do? Okay, so I, I don't think Afghan leanings towards one country or the other country is any of our business until and unless those leanings have an impact on our security, mm. right? It's as simple as that. And to answer your question very, very directly and categorically, Pakistan's interests in Afghanistan are singular. They're not multidimensional. They are very multidimensional, let me correct myself. But in, in terms of what our interests, what the only thing I can call our interest, because our interests are supposed to end on our borders, our ability to implement our interests, right? The only interest that we have of that sort in Afghanistan is that Afghan soil must not be used to stage adventures in Pakistan. And I will be very open in pointing out by India, as it has been. Okay, and we have evidence, and you should speak to your national security people, they also have evidence that that has been done, right? And uh, I remember your defense secretary, the previous one, you have quite a few in the last. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about the, Jim Mattis or? I, I'm actually not going to be able to tell which one because the one in this administration, but early on, uh, so certainly not Esper, but, and probably Jim Mattis, I think it was. Okay, uh, actually spoke about it at a conference openly that, uh, you know, what India was able to do to Pakistan from Afghanistan in the sense that the evidence that they had uh, in, of them staging sort of uh, anti-state behavior within Pakistan, right? And terrorist activity in Pakistan. So that is what our interest is in Afghanistan. That is where it ends. Uh, the rest is for the Afghans to decide and to choose. By the way, you might have noticed, and I'm quite sure nobody noticed because we do these things for, a, you know, at least did it for a living. We noticed, and we thought, we hoped that the world would have noticed that Pakistan stopped asking for a stable, peaceful, friendly Afghanistan and start only asking for a stable and peaceful Afghanistan because it's not Pakistan's business to determine whether a sovereign nation is friendly towards it or unfriendly towards it, right? We made that determination. We were, and none of you noticed this lovely nuanced, you know, thing that we did in our, uh, you know, in how we view, want to view Afghanistan. So that, that, that's really it. We have made our mistakes in the past. We understand and we like to believe that we've learned our lessons from it, okay? And I remember as foreign minister, when I went to Afghanistan, I spent more time with the non-Pashtun leaders by design. And I sometimes find that the non-Pashtun leaders are frankly speaking very easy to deal with, okay? Because they don't have the historical baggage that uh, some of the others might have. So Pakistan's interests end on our borders in terms of our protection of it. Uh, so as, as I said, I, as far as Afghan soil is not used against Pakistan, is the only interest we want to preserve, whether they're friendly with India, if that friendliness is not against Pakistan, we're happy, it's their sovereign right to be friendly with whomever they want. And on when, uh, you know, as the, as the withdrawal happens, look, it really depends on how the withdrawal happens. I don't think we can talk about it in a, such a binary, you know, in a simplistic term, because how the US withdraws 
is going to be of exceptional importance. Okay, is it going to be a hurried, um, uh, you know, un collaborate, just a hurried withdrawal, leaving all sorts of conditions as they are, you know, letting them fight it out? Uh, how is the withdrawal going to be? Uh, wh whether they will keep bases over there, which will continue to have interest of many countries, and perhaps Iran will play a very different role in that scenario. How the U.S. withdraws is going to impact, um, have a greater impact. You know, I cannot say what we will do on U.S. withdrawal because I don't know the conditions in which the U.S. will decide to withdraw. But the only thing we know right now from the two documents, and by the way, I do want to point out, which I find the most interesting, I think the words that have been used for the Taliban yes. in that four-page document, which could have been the two, a two-page document, had the words the Islamic Emirates of Afghanistan, which the U.S. does not recognize as a state, but refers to as Taliban. So this tells you from where to where we've come, right? And this, this in itself, by the way, this small sentence, if you want to call it that, or paraph, uh, is, is so interesting in telling also about the dangers that you have in the future, right? Because what is recognized, what is not recognized, how you're able to broker the peace, how are you... I think the U.S. needs to really, right now, the biggest challenge right now, I think the U.S. Uh, needs to, when it comes to Afghanistan, stop worrying about everything else and really focus on encouraging a true intra-Afghan dialogue and really focus on the Afghan government taking ownership of their position. Okay? Exceptionally important. You can't be in the presidential palace and then look at others to take all the blame and then... You know, it, uh, I, 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 I went, by, by, went by by the rule that anyone who cannot take the responsibility of their seat should empty it. I say this for myself, because many times people would tell me that, oh, as foreign minister, you know, your foreign policy is made by someone else. And I said, if that was the case, I would, if I'm going to complain about somebody else or something else, then I might as well not take responsibility. Till the time you carry the seat, you better take responsibility for whatever happens, right? You can't just have it both ways right so so we'll we can take a, f a final question if there are two questions in the room we can we can bundle them together um, yeah so yeah. i have a question on uh Rishmi. Mm -hmm. uh, is this now a fait accompli then in the sense mm -hmm. that you know india has done what it's done in kashmir and broken the state up into two union territories uh, the international community hasn't responded. As you mm. said, the U.S. has also not really responded much. Um, so what is then Pakistan's best foot forward on this? Is it to try and negotiate an international border and say, you know, this is done now and we can't really do much about it because there isn't any international support? I can tack on a second mm -hmm. question on something you said earlier, which is, you know, you talked about Modi having used Pakistan as a pawn for the elections. Mm -hmm. um, and clearly Pakistan played into it with its response as well to the initial Balakot strike. Uh, the question now is, in subsequent elections, if this is a strategy that the BJP is using, um, what does, how does Pakistan not fall into this trap? Um, and yeah, in similar situations, what is the way forward for it? Given? Okay, if you mean, let me get this straight. If you, if you mean by falling into the trap by uh, Pakistan acting maturely and responsibly and returning the prisoner or the pilot, yes, we will continue to do that and fall I, into I the trap in again. In terms of India conducting an, uh, an airstrike and then Pakistan sort of Look, responding to it. Do not, yeah. do not think that if our airspace is, you know, penetrated in and if a sovereign uh, international border is uh, played with by another country, it is our duty. We are duty bound. We do not have a choice. This is exactly what I'm meant by when I said the escalatory ladder and the conflagration, because we are duty bound then to reciprocate, okay, and to say that here the big India, which feels it is the net arbitrator and security provider for the region, uh, wants to project its military power by penetrating into our airspace and shooting a few trees, well, we could do the same, get your pilot down, and decided not to celebrate that, because we wanted to be a responsible state, right? And we made your pilot the hero, and our pilots who got him down, not the heroes. This is what we decided to do as policy. I think it's great policy. Yes, we are going to fall into the trap again. We are going to do exactly the same because that is the responsible thing to do. Now, uh, the previous question, a uh, fake comply, no, it can never be. I mean, it's been 19, since 1947. Tell me what has India achieved in Kashmir? It has only lost, right? So it really depends on whether we think 
you know, being a rogue state is being a winner. I think in the long run, you are self-harming like nobody's business. I tell my Pakistani colleagues who want to destruct, you know, have destructive designs on India, sit pretty in your seats and let them self-destroy. You don't need to do anything. You know, this is a country which is going on a journey which is against its own interests. And if you want more, so we can only hope for the best because you are, we are, we are not yours, but the, the Indians, we are, we are bound by geography. We can't wish you ill or the Afghans ill or the Iranians ill or the Chinese ill. We are bound by geography, right? So that's, so no, it can never be fair comply. And I, we would just hope that the Indian institutions will kick in. The Supreme Court perhaps will kick in. And maybe, you know, we can look for a different, a resolution of the dispute rather than creating more and more conflagration. Please join me in thanking uh, Minister Hinar Banikar. Thank you so much.